early time, uh, and I ask that you bear with me. This is uh, my first uh, chairmanship and subcommittee uh, uh, assignment on public safety, so I'm going to have to learn many of you, many of you I know. And I'm also here with my good friend, Senator John Albers, chairman of the Appropriations Sub Public Safety Committee for the, uh, for the Senate. Senator, you have uh, any comments you'd like to make? Sure. Yeah, that microphone there. Oh, sorry. Let's see. There's 21. 21. There we go. Good morning. We're a little uh, uh, quick on our times this morning, about 15 minutes each. So if we could ask everyone to, uh, as uh, reasonable as possible, to, to move through the information so we can do a couple of quick Q&As, and I know we'll have plenty of follow-ups, but we're looking forward to serving and working with each one of your agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I think our first witness uh, with prosecuting attorneys, uh, Mr. Spahas, are you presenting? Welcome, gentlemen. I think you have before you what was put together as a PowerPoint was a simple matter of a method of conveying the information. Um, it starts, of course, with a mission statement of the prosecuting attorney for the That mission statement is to assist the prosecuting attorney throughout the state in their efforts to get criminal activity in the state. Um, as you know, we're the state agency that supports all the elected district attorneys, their assistant district attorneys, and their state staff. Both from a training standpoint, a personnel standpoint, IT, basically anything that they need is, is state related, we, we facilitate. Um, one of the big things that we've worked on over the last couple of years is the implementation of the accountability court for assistant DAs and effort to support the governor's push for those courts. Uh, we've been through two cycles now and, and added an additional 27 assistant DAs in the last two years to uh, facilitate those courts. And that second slide shows you how they have, uh, have been implemented. As far as 2015 fiscal request, um, the, the big item is on the governor's budget page number 41 under district attorney, and it's an increase for funds to the district attorney in court travel and training. It's a little history. When we started in budget year 2007, the budgeted amount for the training and travel for the DA was right out of a million dollars, $958,000. We had to ease back to that over the last seven budget cycles, and this year to try to make it back home, the final adjustment is 208000 Let me explain just briefly how we've come to that. The Prosecutor Attorney's Council put together a packet to send to the DAs, and what we do is we collect from them the actual expenditures they had from the previous year related to travel, and then that is put together as a, a, a travel budget, and that's the way the statute is written as for. So that's where that number comes from. That is the last of the amounts to make it back home. But one of the ways, the, big, the way we have covered the shortage over the last two budget cycles is in both budget cycles, we were budgeting an amount of money for accountability for assistant DAs and instructed to implement them throughout the year and to stagger that implementation to deal with some of our shortfalls. And that's exactly what we did. So we put off putting those in service in the circuit until we could make whole the travel budget. So that's how we've covered it to date. And Mary, you want to? Well, I, I only want to make sure that the committee understands is that when we say travel and training, it gives ideas of airplanes and airplanes and out-of-state conferences. And, and that's not really true for district attorneys. We have two annual conferences a year that train most of the prosecutors in the state, one of them in the north end of the state, which is going on this week, and one is in the south end of the state to try and cover this. But more importantly, unlike my circuit, which is a one-county circuit, David and other DAs who have multiple county circuits have to travel and are required by law to reimburse travel to and from court. For instance, in, uh, I learned this morning in Cordell, Denise Bazzini operates a number of counties out of one office and her folks travel literally to the courthouses where they have no office. So they have to have a mobile office and carry what needs to say on the court. And that's pretty typical across the state. So when we're talking about travel, we're talking about getting people to work. We're not necessarily talking about out of state junkets or that we're training out of state. We do all the vast majority of our training is in state and we and the vast majority of this money goes to the actual expenditures of getting people to and travel. Yeah, I'll just add in, in my circuit. 
circuit, uh, we have a number of vehicles. The state doesn't provide any vehicles to the VA in the VA health care, but we do get some vehicles from our county to help support us. Uh, in my circuit, we just buy gas primarily through our travel budget. Uh, other circuits, they don't have the vehicles, and they are paying per diem. It's, it's more expensive to pay the per diem than it is for gas. So in, in my circumstance, you know, those VAs that are using gasoline, quite frankly, we put this budget together last summer, and gasoline, of course, is now under $2 a gallon. So it may very well be that this number can, will come down some uh, based on that and expenses. Okay. And from year to year, of course, we will adjust. If we, if we see that that is what we get out of our VAs, of course, we'll come back to you. And I'll just mention the other item that was in the um, 15 request is a 6188, and it, that's simply an adjustment for roof premium to increase after the budget cycle. Like this, this past year. So that's, that just gets passed along to us to pay on behalf of the district attorney. So. And then we'll be glad to field any questions. Thank you. You just answered the two questions I had. We do have some questions for the committee, and I can't see who it is. I'll push number 19. Thank you. Um, dealing with the travel budget, I'm looking on here, I can see in Coweta, I think this is on your third page in, where they're asking for an increase. Now, I, I know our DA there, Pete, he has a very large circuit to travel. And I can see where that request may be valid because Pete has, I mean, he's got five counties to travel across a pretty big uh, judicial circuit. But then I look to Douglas, and it's, it's one county. That DA has very little to go, but they're asking for a 24% increase. What? Those are the things that kind of catch my eye when I have one county that I know is five counties, and I know that DA has to travel just between courts, but then I see one that they're asking for a 24% increase, and I know it's all housed in one courthouse. The jail's a mile away. Well, yes, yeah, sir. Part of, part of that, if you look, at so you're, you're only actually talking about $2,800. Um, because that circuit is a single county circuit, it's not as much. I will say in that particular circuit, you've got to keep in mind there's, there's a new district attorney and a new administration that's looked at actual expenditures from the previous year to put this together and and I and look we're, we've been up front about the fact that in the past during the shortfalls we've had to scrimp and scrape and look in other places to cover this there used to be for instance there used to be welfare fraud money left around that had been um, reimbursed for federal prosecutions we're now going on almost five years where there have not been any of those prosecutions or reimbursements and those kind of sources have, have just dwindled up and gone away so specifically I can't explain exactly where he came from but you do have a new administration who's reevaluated the expenditures of that office and I suspect that probably attributes to that okay. and one, one other is Brian's in the same boat that I'm in a single county circuit with fairly fairly large staff I have 118 people that work for me of which better than half of them have to maintain their post certification and or their law license, and I have to get mandatory training to them. So whereas I don't travel within the circuit, I have a lot of people that I have to, that I have to get mandatory training. And so this, this would also cover their travel back and forth to Forsyth and other training, things yes, like sir. that for their main Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Coomer, you wave. Okay. I think that was your question, wasn't it? Great. Any other questions from any members of the committee? Mr. Chairman? No, good, thank you. That uh, was succinct and quick, and I thank you for it. Thank yes, you, sir. gentlemen. I never, uh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I do not. I did not. 25? Yes. There we go, sir. Gentlemen, I was looking specifically at the Griffin Circuit because that's one I'm <laughs> very, very familiar with. It's a four county circuit. I was DA there 15 years. They want a uh, 58 percent increase. They have offices in each county. They don't, most of them don't travel the circuit. Uh, every assistant has a call, every investigator has a call, and I know three, at least three if not four secretaries have a call. I also know they take those cars home and some of them may be driving 10 miles, some may be driving 30 miles, and some of them don't even live in the circuit, and they drive out of the circuit. Why do they need a 58% increase? Well, Representative, one of the things that I have to do when I do this is I have to 
submit that document to a district attorney. They have to fill it out and they have to submit it back to us explaining what their needs are. As far as exactly managing the day-to-day dimes that they spend, we don't do that or have the authority to do that. So these numbers are based on the submission from that elected district attorney. Are we paying for secretary's cars and other circuits? Not that I'm aware of. You are in that one. I'll be sure that those specific questions get relayed to that district attorney. And like I say, they have the offices in each county. And they, for the most part, don't work from one county to the other. Sure. Occasionally, they don't misunderstand me. The only one that really does is Thomaston goes up to Zebulon, which is 16 miles. But Griffin works Griffin, Fayette works Fayette. And he could very well have had some additional county funding that he doesn't have anymore and that that's what this is about. I don't know. I'll have to delve down into the specifics and I'll be glad to get the documentation that I received from that district attorney and submit it to you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from any member of the committee? Hearing none, thank you, Judge. Oh, we have one. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just, I was listening to my two colleagues and Atlantic, my circuit, didn't request any increase. There are six counties there. And I just hope we don't poo-poo what was said because I hear some interesting things said from two of my colleagues that really should be looked at. I understand what you're saying when somebody submits, but a submission does not necessarily say need. Now, let's not get back to some old ways because things are lightening up a little bit. I'm concerned about that because I know there's a lot of mileage in the Atlantic Judicial Circuit. And if we can make it on the last appropriation, we need to take a good look. And I'm not familiar with these, but I heard from two gentlemen that are. And I just think we need to take a real close look at especially mileage. And I'm really concerned about what the gentleman from Griffin said about certain vehicles for administrative staff. I mean, I wouldn't like to just say, okay, just because it was submitted. That's just for the record. Well stated. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just looking down the chart. I'm sorry I got here just a few minutes late, but I was noticing Northern District, which I represent up that five-county area. I noticed on here that's Green Line. They didn't make any requests, but I noticed in the, over the last couple of years, we have a new DA doing quite a different job than the old DA had done. And one of the things that I always notice is in the newspaper, he's continually going to the county commissioners, talking about need more money for travel, more need more money for this and that. But I notice there's no request down here for him where I see it pretty well scattered through the litany. Could you tell me what was the criteria that these DAs or the different districts that they asked for, or maybe why this one wasn't asked, or maybe some of them are relying on the local counties to subsidize instead of coming up with a straight-up request through the budget? Yes, sir. There is some reliance in some situations on the counties. It depends on the relationship with the DAs. I will say this about that circuit, I believe, and I'll go back and look. We did some adjusting last year on request, and several of the DAs that are not requesting here, we made good adjustments last year to balance that out. So if there's not been a significant change from last year to this year, that may be why the Northern Circuit didn't ask for any this year. But that being said, I'll be glad to pull that request and compare it to the previous year for you and supply it as well. If you could. Yes, sir. Because that seems to be an area of contention that when a state office is continually asking local commissioners as opposed to drawing down in the normal budget process. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions from any member of the committee? Representative Kennedy. 
Just, just a quick question. Um, if funds are allocated or appropriated for travel through this budget process and then those funds are not used, what happens with the excess funds? If we have excess funds at the end of the year, I obviously will turn those in. I mean, I know there's a process we go through uh, to facilitate that. We, this budget is based on the request of ag expenditures of last year is how we calculate that. We were talking about that earlier. If we look at the end of the year and they have not expended that amount, because fuel prices have gone down or what have you, then that's going to be the excess funds that will be sent back to the state. So well, there's a little bit somewhere else. Okay, so the, I guess my question really is, is there discretion in the DA's office to use that money for something other than strictly travel? No, sir. We do it, we do it from a reimbursement standpoint. They submit the, the expenditure to, to the state and we pay that. Expenditure. Okay, thank you. Another circuit actually has more of an actual policy than what the way the budget's reported in the circuit. And it has to be an offset. Thank you. That'll have to be the last question. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your testimony. And thank you for staying on time. We now our next witness is the Department of Defense. General, good to have you. Welcome. Thank you very Gentlemen. much. Good morning. We've got Kenley Finlinson with me and Russell Carlson. Thank you. And uh, before I get started, uh, we got some YCA cadets handing out a pamphlet. And uh, I know there are several members of the um, committee that are have served previously and want to commend you on that and uh, got to specifically give a shout out to Representative Coomer who is current member of the Air National Guard and Senator Albert's son who is a current member of the Army National Guard. So thank you all for your service. The, um, first of all, I'd like to express how honored I am to be here in front of you as the Adjutant General of Georgia uh, and as such the leader of the best National Guard in the nation. Um, I'm not saying that to boast but to inform you of the outstanding men and women uh, that represent you and this great state um, to the, in service to the Georgia citizens and our nation. Uh, their accomplishments, and when I say there, I'm talking about the Army and Air National Guardsmen, state employees, and our all-volunteer State Defense Force personnel, uh, their accomplishments are truly remarkable. Our J-STARS Air National Guard Unit Warner Robins is the only unit of its kind in the U.S. Department of Defense and has been overhead supporting the war on terror in Southwest Asia since the war began. The 48th Brigade Headquarters just returned last fall from another rotation in Afghanistan. And while they were there, um, one day last June, that brigade had soldiers in eight different nations. We currently have soldiers in Jordan training the Jordanian Brigade that is charged with watch watching the Jordan-Syria border. So this organization is not great because of any one single leader, but the collective efforts of those outstanding Georgia citizens. Some of you may not realize that we had one of the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff attend the change of command ceremony between General Butterworth and me last um, on the 8th of January. It's significant that General Grass came to the ceremony, but what speaks even louder is the fact that he was here at 9 o'clock in the morning and spent the entire day with us, and he spent the day visiting soldiers and airmen in this outstanding organization. I feel I, I should remind this body that with just over $9 mil million dollars that you provide on the state side, the federal government provides over $500 million, and our organization pays over $25 million in state income tax alone, uh, again, against the $9 million that you provide. So having said that, I need to get to the business at hand, and, and while we do not have a mid-year request, uh, we do have a FY16 request, and I'd like to address uh, page 157 of the governor's recommendation and discuss our Youth Challenge Academy program that touches a couple 
of the governor's strategic priorities, and those are criminal justice reform and education. The Youth Challenge Academy program is funded jointly by federal and state funds. The split is 75% federal and 25% state. We currently have two campuses and are ready to open a third. Opening a third campus will increase the number of at-risk high school dropouts we can get back on the path to being productive citizens in our state. The 456K in the recommendation is the startup cost for the Milledgeville campus. I can promise you Milledgeville is excited about this opportunity and this campus will fill a void in the middle of the state and will draw from historically underserved rural areas. While our current two campuses are at Fort Gordon and Fort Stewart, um, this is a statewide program, so I, I don't want to lose sight of that. A RAND Corporation cost-benefit analysis found that YCA programs generate $2.66 in benefit for every dollar expended, 166% return. And I can tell you firsthand um, that the program truly changes the lives of the young Georgians that it serves. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, General, and thank you for your service, and especially the men and women that work with you. It's not unnoted. Thank you. Uh, any members of Kennedy Center? Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, again, congratulations. We are very proud of you and everyone who serves under your command. Thank you. uh, I'm a very much supporter of the Youth Challenge Academies and, and got to see some of them in action. Uh, my question, and, and I'm glad the governor has made this a priority yet again, um, as we continue this uh, expansion, are we looking out two, three, four, five years as to other ones that might need to be strategically located throughout the state? The uh it's a pretty significant process to start another campus, and so um, I think we're we're looking at this one for the for many years out, uh, and probably not starting another one in the near future. Fair enough. And then, as far as the demand, um, obviously having two online, soon to be a third. Is there a waiting list of people trying to get in now? Where is the the supply and demand? I, I'll have to. Uh, I can't remember. Go ahead, Russell. Yes, sir. Hey, on on any given cycle. Thank you, Russell. Could we add additional classes to the current locations, uh, or are they maxed out at two? They're, they're, they're maxed, maxed out. In the, in the, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. They're maxed out in the calendar perspective. Uh, the National Guard, the Youth Challenge Program, per you know, it, its initial uh, legislation is a 22-week program. So in that sense, we're, we're maxed out from just a calendar perspective. But but we could address that through space. You know. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Rogers. General Gerard, first of all, congratulations. Well deserved. Thank you. And uh, very proud of you. This, you may have just answered this, uh, Russell. Um, do you know um, how many you have currently enrolled in the program right now? Great. <clears throat> and I guess the other, the follow-up to that would be, do you know how many have gone through the program since its inception and what type of, what type of success rate you've had? Yes, sir. I think we're over to 13,000 more. Yes, sir. <clears throat> since its inception, we, we're, we're proud. We start out with one campus at Stewart, so we went six, seven years with just one class, <clears throat> then that at Fort Gordon, uh, totaling uh, we've been over 13,000 graduates uh, this year. 
So it's fair to say you've touched 13,000 lives. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General, and your staff. Certainly glad to have you all here. I represent Fort Stewart, so I've, I've seen this program since its inception. And the only problem I have with it is I wish it was twice the size because it, it, it's just kind of touching the surface of the water. One of, one of the things that's so important here, and I think it ties in, it gets ahead of the curve on the governor's prison reentry program. So much cheaper to keep folk out of jail than to deal with them after they have been in jail. And many of your cadets, for the first time in their lives, have a male influence in direction and discipline. But most importantly, I get a chance to talk to a lot of the cadre. And one of the problems is bottom line pay. It's, it's tough what they do for what they're paid. And, and, and I'm glad to see that in here. I don't know how much, but I, I do know that there is a need for better pay for the cadre that operate under sometimes some very difficult circumstances. Most of us get to see this when we hear about it, but when you see firsthand what these cadre have to do on a day-by-day -day basis, they're some of the most underpaid state employees we have. Just want to say that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Williams. Any other questions from any member of the committee? Mr. Chairman? You did well, General. Thank you very much. Thank you and very I much. appreciate it. Appreciate Thank you for time. being time. <laughs> Next up, the Department of Public Safety. <clears throat> Colonel, welcome. Morning, Mr. Chairman. And welcome. Thank you for your service. I think you flew a few Marine airplanes, didn't you, for a while? A long time ago, yes, sir. I thought you did. I thought you did. This is Peter Adams. He's our comptroller. He's also our poster boy for the use of hair product. Uh, Representative <laughs> Hightower. <laughs> this is the man that I was talking to you about. I know you're the poster boy for the house as far as hair products concerned, but this is our man. So. There's hope we can keep it going. Right. A fashion plate. <laughs> Be up here. That's it. <laughs> uh, the Department of Public Safety has three divisions. Um, I guess the most familiar to uh, the committee is the Uniform Division, which is the Georgia State Patrol. The second is our Motor Carrier Compliance Division. Those are our truck inspectors, the folks that are experts with commercial motor vehicles. And then the third is the Capitol Police Division. That's post 50. Those are the troopers that provide the security to the Capitol and here at the CLOB. And then the Capitol Police officers uh, and the safety officers that provide the security for those buildings within five miles that are Georgia Building Authority buildings. We have about 1,100 sworn. Our trooper strength now is 832. We have a school that's in session that will graduate 34 uh, on the 20th of February. That will put our strength over 860 sworn. Uh, the patrol hasn't seen 860 troopers in almost 15 years, so we're making some progress there. I'd refer the committee to uh, the uh, governor's budget, page 156. We have one item under field offices and services. Now, the recommended is an increase of $3,183,005. This is in two parts. Uh, the first is a leftover from fiscal year 2009 when we moved 40 troopers from the Uniform Division because we were having cuts in state funds at the time to the Motor Carrier Division because we had some federal funds that were available. The reason why we did this is we are required to have a speed enforcement component uh, in uh, that area on commercial motor vehicles. This allowed us to save the jobs of 40 troopers and specifically put them in an area where there was a requirement for speed enforcement. At that time, the officers of the Motor Carrier Compliance Division were not allowed to do speed enforcement, so the troopers were moved there. Now as time moved on, 
and our forces were drawn down uh, because of budget. We had to get them back in their lane. And in 2014, we moved those 40 positions back over into the Georgia State Patrol. Uh, that was done so without any funds, and we absorbed that mostly through attrition. But about 17 of those, uh, roughly $1.3 million, was not covered. So that 1.3 is part of this 3.1. The second part of it, the 1.8, is we are seeing uh, a large amount of our folks starting to retire. As you know, we have two retirement systems that are kind of coming to a head. The 34-year retirement system is over with, and now the 30-year retirement system is hitting, and we've had a large amount of our folks start to retire. And so anticipating that, we're taking a look at our expenditures both to ERS and to what is known as annual leave payouts. For those on the committee, uh, peace officers are governed by a system of hours by the federal government where in a 28-day period of time they work 160 hours. Anything between 160 and 171 hours provides them comp time. Anything over 171 hours, depending upon their position, they're paid FLSA, federal comp time. Well, that amount of time between 160 and 171 is comp time that's taken off. And when it's taken off, it's used in lieu of their annual leave, which then accumulates. So when we have a person that works 34 years or works 30 years and we don't have a lot of manpower, they tend to accumulate a lot of annual leave. And so anticipating those retirements, anticipating what we're already seeing with our annual leave payouts and that our increase of what we have to pay to the, uh, the retirement system, it's an additional 1.8. So that's where the 3.1 comes up. Those two issues, moving those 17 troopers back over and recouping those dollars in state funds, and then what we're anticipating in retirement. Right now, we anticipate that potentially over the next two years, we'll have between 70 and 80 of our sworn personnel retire. So it's kind of coming to a head between those two retirement systems. We're seeing that, but we're anticipating those expenditures. We brought that forward, and that's why it's in the governor's recommendation We'd love to have your support. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Colonel, thank you again for your service and all the great work uh, of the agencies and, and folks uh, under your command. Uh, with having such a large retirement boom, and uh, it's great to see 34 uh, new folks coming through the academy, uh, how are we prepared to continue to fill uh, those voids and obviously continue to gain the experience because when those folks leave, we obviously have lost a lot of institutional knowledge in their wake. Uh, you're telling me, brother. Uh, we, used, <laughs> we used to have a lot of master troopers, a lot of folks that were uh, in the line, on the road, uh, and they were kind of that guiding hand. And um, we are filling uh, that void, but the fact of the matter is, is uh, the patrol is a young patrol. Um, so a lot of our 15-year folks uh, are having to step up and fill that void where we had those 25- and 30-year folks with experience. Um, we've been very fortunate over the years through your support and the governor's support to be able to use attrition funds, which would be normally taken away, to be able to continue our trooper schools. And that's why with that support you see our manpower slowly but surely edging up. But the fact of the matter is it is a young patrol, and some of our mid-line uh, folks are having to provide that guidance uh, because that older crowd's gone. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hightower. You said, I believe, between 70 and 80 over the next two years, plan to retire? Yes, sir. What's the norm? Like, take that anomaly out, those, that large number. What's the normal retirement rate? Um, we have anywhere between 30 and 40, but we're seeing the high end and mm -hmm. it increasing. Uh, so that's kind of what we anticipate. You know, we can't tell people that they have to retire. Sure. And in hard times, we've had a lot of folks that have kept their jobs. Um, I currently have a person that's on my command staff that we refer to as Methuselah. He's been around for 37, almost 38 years. Uh, if, Colonel, if Colonel Hitchens could have continued on, I think we would have seen him for 50 years. Um, <laughs> but we have We're a lot of We're going to cut out the old jokes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of folks that have had their time to retire, uh, that have stayed on during hard times, uh, and you know uh, that, that benefits us when we do are able to keep that experience. Uh, I kiddingly call this person Methuselah, but I'm glad to have him.
because there's many times where uh, this young person uh, wants to go in a particular direction and Major Fielding says, hold up on that car wash, and he's usually right. Gotcha. One, one other question, if I could. On the uh, 2.7 that you have, uh, looks like it's on here. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. That's right. Thank you. Chairman Willard. Thank you, Colonel. I, uh, I was wondering, over the years, we've had uh, a good bit of attrition out of the department going to local law enforcement, sheriff's departments, and police departments. We gave some raises, not enough, I would say, but we gave some. Tell you, can you tell us what's happening as far as that issue of attrition? I'll, I'll, I'll always advocate for higher pay for our folks I know, uh, because they, they deserve every dollar yes, that sir. they get. But the fact of the matter is we have a very low attrition rate. Now, Where we see our attrition rate is in our training. But the fact of the matter is, is once we get people through trooper school, yes. our attrition rate is about 4.8 to 5 percent. That's pretty low. When you take a look at what corrections goes through or some other department goes through, uh, once we have those folks trained and once we get them uh, in the field, uh, we hold on. That's to over them. what period of time? We look at career-wise or five yes, years? Yes, sir. That's 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 career-wise. Career-wise. Career yes, sir. That's career-wise. We have about a five percent attrition okay. rate. That's right. <coughs> May I follow up one other question? And I know there's been some limitations, I think a full limitation is having troopers do anything as far as outside employment. Is that still a policy or has there anything been done to modify that as to allow them to have off-duty time working as a, uh, in some form of law enforcement? Our sworn officers depend very heavily on their off-duty employment. Okay. Um, within a one-week period of time, <coughs> they're allowed to work a total of 64 hours. That's a combination of the 40 hours for the state uh, and 24. then 24 hours. Now, okay. if they end up working over, then that limits their off-duty time. Yes, sir. Um, but we limit to them to 64 hours, and the reason for that is is that they get appropriate rest between Correct. the time that they're working and between time that they have to go back on duty. Good. So right now it's limited to 64 hours, 40 on duty if they don't work more than that, and 24 hours off-duty police employment. Has that been a recent change in the last several years? No, sir. As long, okay. as long as I've been on for the past I 20 thought, years, that's been the policy. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Rogers. Colonel, I, uh, a couple of years ago, you faced a situation where there was a fuel problem. And I know in my district especially, there's a tremendous amount of mileage for our troopers to cover up there. Are, are you content with where we are fuel-wise now? I know the price of, of gas is down, but are, are you content with that? Thank you, Jesus, for $1.89. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is, is the troops have been on uh, a budget, a budget that they have to personally watch for their fuel expenses. Uh, and that dollar figure has been maintained up until November. Once we saw that the fuel prices were coming down, we took that patrol restriction off. And so they're not restricted in their patrol miles anymore, and they're able to go back. Now, we'll watch that uh, because fuel prices are as volatile in one direction as they are in another. Uh, and we saw with, you know, one natural disaster with Katrina in 2005, it went to 335. Uh, we actually saw a, uh, an article today that's predicting, you know, $5 a gallon gas. But uh, we'll take a dollar eighty-nine as long as the Lord gives it to us because that, that absolutely takes that restriction away and puts us uh, in a nice position with our fuel. So you're okay with it, Rodney? Yeah, absolutely, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? H hearing none, thank you, Colonel, for your thank testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Next up is the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> Director Keenan, welcome, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Glad to see you. Members of the committee, I have with me Connie Buck, who is the uh, GBI fiscal officer and the keeper of the books. The uh, I would like to uh, address the governor's recommendation and seek your support for it uh, as it relates to the GBI medical examiner's office. And um, the GBI operates uh, medical examiner's office and we service 152 of the 159 counties. We do over 3,000 autopsies a year and another 1,700 death consultations. Um, we, have, we do autopsies at our headquarters complex, and we do autopsies in Macon and Savannah. 
We used to do autopsies in Augusta, Somerville, and Moultrie, but we no longer do that for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm seeking your support for the governor's recommendation to give a pay increase to the medical examiners. The, we need this for recruitment purposes, and we need this for retention purposes. For your information, there are only 450 board-certified forensic pathologists in the nation and we have 14 of them working at the GBI. Uh, uh, Director, you know, I don't mean to cut you off. Yes, I just sir. want to be sure we clarify. You're talking for, for, for 16, correct? Correct. I got We you. have, okay. no, have not, no, not for no the, amended budget. Got you. Go ahead, sir. I'm Sorry. talking from page 254 in the governor's recommendation. I heard a lot of ruffling of, of books there, so yeah. I thought I might yes, ask. Sir. I'll be talking from page uh, 254, and the other page is uh, in the bond package. Um, our issue is this, because of the limited number of board certified forensic pathologists, it takes us two years to recruit someone. The doctors that we have been able to recruit come out of their having completed their fellowship and then they go on to the market and we're in, we're in competition with the rest of the country in trying to uh, recruit the doctors to come here. A forensic pathologist is a man or woman who has completed medical school, has become a doctor, and then has spent an additional two years in forensics, uh, forensic fellowship, a very highly specialized type of medical work. Um, we want to give our doctors a pay increase of uh, approximately 12 percent. This would put us competitive with the southeast in retaining the doctors. It would also give us an opportunity to recruit new, a new doctor because last year the General Assembly gave us the 15th doctor position, but we've been unable to fill that because the, the starting salary is not compatible with, with the other areas that we're competing with. Uh, we, we'd, uh, and we believe that the $480,000 for the doctor's increase will help uh, direct the pro address the problems of the retention and the recruitment of the new doctor. We just lost one of our doctors, uh, went to Cobb County for a substantial pay raise, and so now we're, we're, we'll be two doctors now. Um, I have told, talked to the governor's office many times and tell them that my greatest fear as GBI director is to wake up and not have enough doctors to do the autopsies that are needed to be done for the state of Georgia and the local communities that rely on us. Uh, so I seek your support for that. The other two items are on page 22, and this relates to the bond package. We do the vast majority of our autopsies at our GBI headquarters complex. Quite frankly, we're out of space there. We need to double the size of the morgue uh, at our headquarters complex. Last Monday when I came to work, we had 27 bodies in the morgue and there was not enough room for those bodies. They had to open up the sally port, let cold air in there, and leave the body stored there that we could do the autopsies. So we have asked in the bond package, and, uh, and the governor has put in his budget, uh, $6.68 million for the design and construction of the expansion of the morgue. This would give us, this would double the size of the capacity in the morgue. Uh, to be able to handle uh, 50 bodies coming in and 50 bodies co going out. The, uh, also give us additional uh, space for the doctors. Um, the, set, the final part of the uh, governor's recommendation relates to the bond package, which is $1.1 million in design funds for the Savannah Crime Laboratory. Our laboratory in Savannah was constructed in 1986. It is grossly outdated, and it has inadequate spa space for staff. As, the, as that part of the state continues to grow, we're going to need increased staffing in the, me in the uh, medical examiner office there and also the crime laboratory. We've got 22 staff there now. In the near future, we're going to need 30 to 35 and a third, and a third medical examiner. So I, I seek your support in uh, doing the design for that and then coming back with the uh, with, with the cost to build a new uh, crime laboratory there uh, the following year. With that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Director. Mr. Chairman? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, good to see you again. Yes, sir. Thank you again for your service and uh, all the agents under your command. Uh, I know you and I discussed this briefly yesterday, but for the purpose of uh, the entire committee, uh, one of my questions to you uh, was keeping up with the backlog. Uh, and uh, if you can just give us an update of how you, you're, you're keeping up with it now, however, um, that can change at any day uh, so we can be aware of uh, your staffing challenges. Yes, sir. Our, our staffing challenges in the overall crime laboratory are this. We operate at, we operate at minimal staffing. Uh, if we have a scientist that goes out on extended medical leave, leaves us for another job, goes out on maternity leave, that, that's, that scientist is no longer behind the bench processing cases and it affects the backlog. There is no, there is no surplus of scientists there. Uh, so it, in, the, in the near future, I'm going to have to come before the legislature and ask for additional scientists in certain key areas, for instance, toxicology. Toxicology is, is critical to the death investigation process. Uh, when, you hear, when you hear issues about delays in getting autopsy reports, generally that is not a staffing level, it is the complexity of the crime. But uh, we, it, it's very, uh, can be a serious matter to operate at minimal staffing when, the, when, when we've got the cases continuing to come into the, uh, come into the, kit, come into the, the laboratory. We are the crime laboratory for the state of Georgia. There are no local laboratories that do, do the full service work. We, we, every case that is investigated, every case that's prosecuted, where there's physical evidence that's forensically examined, it is our laboratory that does that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator C. No? Out of button. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I don't know. She's much prettier. I can't. I can't see the numbers as they go around. My mistake. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just hoping it was Senator C's. Huh? I promise I'm on my best behavior, <laughs> Director. Always good to see you, and my thanks to you and your uh, men and women. The uh, salaries. Uh, what's the current salaries on the uh, the certified docs that we have? The, the the doctor will the doctor will start out between 136 and 158, depending on what their education level is. The 12 percent uh, will that keep us in competition? Do you think? It will for the southeast. The reason I ask that question on the historical uh, knowledge that I've gained over these years, we've lost. We've gone through a period of years that we lost so many of our better certified people. Um, you used to say we lost them to the federal government and to federal agencies, but now it appears from your comments we're starting to lose them to local governments now. Yes, sir. The, um, we, 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 made, we made great inroads with that because the legislature for three years in a row gave pay increases to the scientists and the agents. That helped uh, that, that virtually eliminate the problem of our retention problem currently because the federal agencies weren't hiring and it made us competitive with local agencies. So I thank the legislature for helping us with our retention problems. Uh, this is the one area that was left out, the doctors, of course, and this has just manifested itself, you know, in the last last year or so. Further question, if this is if this is a situation with our uh, our pathologist and our uh, those specialists, how's our manpower doing? Are y'all continuing to lose agents? Field agents and the such to uh, to other organ to other agencies. No, sir. With, with the pay, with the pay with the pay raises that we got, that has stopped the hemorrhage of of uh, agents leaving us to go to local agencies. Uh, this will probably change when the federal government starts hiring again. GBI agents have the same qualifications as an FBI agent. So when the federal agencies get to hiring, they look around to where they can get the best people and it's going, going to be us. But right now we're doing, we're doing well. Our problem is with the medical examiner issue here. Now we, we're carrying vacancies. We've got nine agent vacancies that are unfilled because we have to have their salaries to defer cost and the other, in, you know, in operating costs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Brett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good to see you again, Director yes, Keenan. We met not too long ago with a group of Southwest Georgia legislators in Moultrie yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. And, and, and talked about some of the issues going on here. There was a, um, a uh, 
a buildup of the Moultrie Crime Lab, as you recall, maybe a decade or so. And so I assumed that there was a dynamic that said, you know, we've got to grow what we're doing because of the growing population and other concerns. Right. Now what we've done is we've closed three offices down to two, and I'm concerned about those costs being uh, placed on the local levels in terms of in the local enforcement in terms of having to transport uh, those. So address that if you would. And secondly, we also spoke of, as it relates to the uh, pathologist, we also spoke of perhaps looking at some kind of dialogue between your department and the Medical College of Georgia, Regents University, and some other things to make sure that we look at that pipeline to see if we're doing what we can um, to fulfill the future needs of Georgia. Will you address what's been done in that regard as well? And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes sir. The, uh, the, first off, in the, in the, we closed down with crime laboratories. That shows you how serious the budget was eight years ago. Is the need there then? Sir. Is the need there then? Um, let, me, let me put it this way. The most cost of effective way to deliver forensic science is to have a central laboratory where we can do assembly line work. Having the regional laboratories gives good customer service at the local level, but it also is a higher cost per case. As we have trimmed back in the agency with the budget, we shut down crime laboratories to, because we could deliver the service better in a centralized laboratory. The Moultrie Laboratory came within, it was slated for closure. The legislature stepped in at last minute to put <coughs> enough money in to keep the laboratory open. The medical examiner left. We've been unable to fill that position. I don't believe we'll be able to have medical examiners anywhere other than the major metropolitan areas. Um, the doctors want to work as a team. They don't, they don't want to be a single doctor out in Moultrie or Augusta operating by themselves. That's not the way these, not, not, not the way these men and women work. We have looked at uh, other issues about having contract doctors. We looked at, uh, we, at one time we had a fellowship with the Medical College of Georgia uh, to keep, keep, try to keep people in the pipeline for medical examiners. It is, it is going to be unworkable to deliver the level of service and the quality of service that we do now by trying to outsource to a local doctor who's a medical examiner work. They don't want to do it. Um, they don't want to testify in court, and that's very problematic. So we're, we're, you know, we'll be looking at the medical examiner uh, in Medical College of Georgia again. And it's been recommended to me that we go to them to do our autopsies. They're not going, they're not going to do this work. No, but doctor, hospitals do not want the bodies that we have coming into their facilities. And the doctors are quite frankly not trained to do forensic pathology work and they're not going to go to court and be cross-examined over that. One follow-up if I may. I guess we, we we talked about things like loan forgiveness, perhaps incentivizing people to get into that line of work to increase uh, the supply. We've done that in other areas before, and I, I didn't know if that kind of discussion had been held. I, we, our, we've looked at this across the board, and what we believe is the answer to us getting the staffing levels we need is increase the salaries the, of, the, uh, of the doctors, the entry-level salaries. I've also written a letter to OPB and state personnel board asking to be able to pay for relocation expenses for a doctor that we recruit as the, as the final enticement to get them get them coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one question from the chair. Could you repeat the uh, expenditures that you have per salary of the pathologist? Yeah, the pathologist is, is, is the, the starting salary is between 136 and 158. Am I correct on this? Depending on, depending on their level of, uh, of, uh, of attainment. Some of them are already board certified. They will get the higher salary. Some, some of them are in the process of taking their exams. They get a lower salary. Well, I'll tell you, we can't play with this. Um, I can remember the problem we had at the, uh, on the federal level with the FBI laboratory a number of years yes, ago. Sir. I would like uh, to, uh, to point a personal privilege, if I may, after the session. I'd like to come up, if I could, visit your laboratory. I'm, yes, near, sir. I'm near Savannah. I'd love to do that. Uh, Welcome it, everyone here. Okay. We, got a, we have a world-class laboratory. Yeah, you do, and I'd like, to, I'd like to come up and spend a little time with you if that would be all right. Yes, sir. So. You make an excellent point. The one thing we do not want to have in the state of Georgia is a problem with not only the state crime laboratory, but the medical examiner system. If you go on the Internet and look up debolicals and medical examiner's offices, it'll, 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 
gives you the nightmares that I have to mm -hmm. wake up and not have resources and have poor quality control and then you have a major scandal with uh, in the ME's office. Any other questions for members of the committee? Mr. Chairman? None. Hearing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, sir. sir. You're welcome anytime to visit. Yeah. Next up is the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee. Director Bunn, Deputy Director Hatfield, welcome. I hope no one's been twisting your arm there. I noticed that you... <laughs> I uh, actually had a little incident before the, right at the end of the year, and broke my wrist. So. Oh, oh, bless you! All right, yes. well, we're uh, ready. Uh, ready moving when you forward. Are. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We're ready when you are. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, or CJCC, is responsible for administering numerous grants. Uh, these state and federal grants serve law enforcement, criminal justice endeavors, and victims of crime and violence um, around the state. In addition, CJCC administers the Georgia Crime Victims Emergency Fund and Victims Compensation Program. CJCC's federal grants come both from the U.S. Department of Justice and as a result of the transfer of programs from the Governor's Office of Children and Families um, last session, several U.S. Department of Health and Human Services programs, grants. Additionally, CJCC oversees the state-funded grants for accountability courts, juvenile justice reform, and domestic violence and sexual, sexual assault centers. Um, we have no changes in the um, fiscal year 15 budget, but I'm happy to address the fiscal year 16 uh, if it pleases the committee. Okay, our budget recommendations begin on page 254 of the governor's budget. CJCC's FY16 budget reflects nearly a $17 million uh, change, um, and that's almost exclusively based on increases for grant funds for accountability courts, the Juvenile Justice Reform Initiative, and a transfer of funding for domestic violence and sexual assault centers. And the governor's FY2016 budget on pages, uh, lines one through three, they reflect fringe rate adjustments as well as a small $5,000 addition for merit-based pay adjustments and retention initiatives. If you take a look at lines 4 through 10, it provides an overall $3.8 million increase in programs for the different types of accountability courts. Other than items uh, number 6 and 10, these are simply expansions of pre-existing grants. Number 6 provides uh, the first-year match funding required to support the recently obtained Federal Veterans Court grant. I gave my uh, staff a charge last year to try to identify new grants that we weren't currently taking advantage of, and they did very well in the, competi in the com competitive arena and got um, one of the grants, new grants we got was for Veterans, a veterans Court. Um, and that grant was actually one and a half million dollars. Line 10 expands the funding for the MOU with the Department of Corrections to cover both their existing daytime reporting centers as well as to provide transportation services to offenders who are otherwise unable to attend their prescribed treatment in court. Uh, and all these items reflect an overall increase in accountability court programmatic funding of 25 percent. Line 11 provides an overall increase in juvenile justice incentive grant funds for just over 1.1 million, bringing the total state funds appropriation for juvenile justice incentive grants to counties to $7.4 million. Line 12 provides $450,000 for an MOU between the Accountability Court Funding Committee and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities in order to provide model fidelity reviews on treatment providers who are serving accountability courts. In addition to pro providing positions uh, at the Department of Behavioral Health uh, to coordinate treatment. Finally, you'll see a new program um, heading in the budget pages entitled Criminal Justice Coordinating Council Family Violence with a line item for $11.8 million. 
These are the state funds for domestic violence and sexual assault um, shelters, which were previously held by the Department of Human Services and administered by the Governor's Office of Children and Families. CJCC is presently administering these funds through a, an MOU with DHS, and the transfer from DHS will improve the efficiency of their distribution to the receiving shelters. These funds are exclusively for grants for, to agencies and are set aside in a new program in order to keep them readily identified and isolated to their purpose in the budget. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have my um, budget director and also my deputy, Stephen Hatfield, here. Thank you, Director. Just for the uh, uh, members of the committee, on just a few of the uh, of the folks that are testifying this morning, the chair did ask them to address the 2016 budget. Those that had no changes, uh, two or three, in the interest of, of judicial economy, a little bit as we move into our uh, 2016 hearings, also, because we're going to be spending more time with folks like the, the judges and others, and that's why you very kindly did that, and I thank you for it. Uh, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Director, I just wanted to say that when the program was transferred for the domestic violence. There was some concern, and I was one of them, about the budget. Uh, some of these funds getting kind of mixed up. But uh, I'm proud to report that I've seen that you've kept the budgeting just as it was directed. And this is one of those little known areas, domestic violence, that you know folks don't take a hard look at, but so vital in in all of our districts and. Thank you all for doing what continues to be a good job with Thank that. You. Thank you, Representative Williams. Representative Coomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today. I wanted to uh, ask you a question about one particular issue, the, the issue of veterans' courts, uh, so something I've worked on professionally and, and spent a lot of personal time working on that, that particular aspect of accountability courts. Can you tell us how many uh, veterans courts have been set up in the state and uh, and and how many we're looking at bringing online and then how many are coming in the pipeline um, right now I believe that there's four that are up and operating and with this grant we uh, expect to have eight that will be operating within the next year or so. We, of course, are getting them all the proper training that they need through the National Association for Drug Court Professionals to make sure that they're prepared. And because veterans' courts is one of the most difficult courts to get started. Um, but the federal government obviously saw that the state of Georgia is doing a lot in the arena of accountability courts, and that's why that they granted us this uh, competitive grant. And we're excited to get started. We've been working with the funding committee. And, um, We've had many meetings already, and we're working with a, a research partner to evaluate that to show the benefits. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Representative. Representative Williams, did you have another question, or did I fail to punch the button? Okay, go ahead. I apologize. I, That's okay. The um, Representative Coma brought up the Veterans Court. Uh, very important. I, I probably represent percentage-wise, the highest percentage of veterans of any district in this, in proportion to population in this state. And the problem has been and continues to be, and rightfully, not rightfully so, but we tend to spend a lot of time with the Iraqi Afghanistan veterans, and, 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 and that's a good thing. But we've forgotten that the vast majority of problems remain with our Vietnam veterans who are still by and large a forgotten entity and anybody want to do a personal survey half the people on the bridges out there are Vietnam veterans and hoping that these new veteran courts will be for all veterans and 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 in spite of some efforts recently the Vietnam veteran is still the forgotten veteran service in this country. I think veteran courts are a good thing. We're a little slow in my district getting started, but we, we certainly hope to. Thank you. Well, we recognize that the, the needs of veterans are a little unique, and it was because of that I urged the staff to, to work to secure this competitive grant so that we could more rapidly mm -hmm. expand our veterans courts. 
Thank you, Representative Williams. Uh, uh, I concur in, in his testimony. I served for 34 years active in reserve with the Marine Corps, and I know many, many good friends, especially among the Vietnam veteran community, that, that uh, it, uh, it touches your heart, and it's something I'm personally interested in, not only with the Vietnam veterans, but all our veterans, and I'm, I'm so glad to see us moving forward in that regard. So are there any other questions from members of the committee? Hearing none, thank you, and thank you for staying on the time frame. So. Next up, the Department of Juvenile Justice. Good morning. How's everybody? <laughs> Excellent. Yes, indeed. Commissioner, welcome. Yes, you, sir. you have. Uh, after my 6.30 meeting with the Appropriations Chairman this morning, you have, you've obviously gotten more caffeine than I have, so I'm glad to have you with us. Well, and you know I don't even drink coffee. <laughs> um, I'm just excited to be here with you to present. I have with me Ms. Sonia Allen, who's our Chief Financial okay. Officer uh, with the Department. Um, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I just want to talk a little bit about um, where we are compared to where we were last year this time. Um, we still see at the Department of Juvenile Justice a steady increase of youth that's coming in with mental health issues. Some 40% of the kids that entered our facility on last year had some sort of mental health issue. The shocking thing is over 50% of those same kids had some form of substance abuse issues. Um, the good thing about juvenile justice reform is that we keep seeing a decline in entry of our facilities. So the treatment, the facilities, the, the area where the kids are getting the most treatment are being done in the communities. In the communities. 42% reduction in our youth that's waiting placement. And when I say placement, meaning those kids that, that's in need of service the enhancement opportunities that, that's going on concerning the treatment. And you and I both know that, that kids that come into our care, those that need treatment, needs treatment. And we're doing everything within our power and, and following the governor's lead on it, getting the kids the treatment that they need to be successful and turning their lives around. Our overall budget, um, and our amended budget request is 13 point, or 13, $313 million. Um, it's our total, 92.9 .9 million of that is for our secure confinement. 110 million of that is in our secure detention. Our RYDC regional youth De development centers and then our youth detention facilities, long care. 85.4 million of that is in our community service and then 24.3 is in, in our administration area. Let me talk about our education real quick, if you don't mind. Over the last three years, we've seen a sturdy increase of our guys and girls, our youth coming into our system uh, still three and a half to four percent behind on the grade point average. But the good thing is while we have them in our care, over the past three years education has increased. We've got more kids that's graduating with high school diplomas, more kids getting their GEDs, more kids that's getting technical diplomas while they're in our care. That's our first time in the history that that has happened. The governor is a firm believer and I support it. If we can educate our kids, those that want to be educated should get educated. Those that want a job skill, let's get them a job skill so that they can be successful. And that's the things that we're doing. And you will see within the, the budget, we have moved monies to, to label and the direct that to happen. 
to where the first time in our history we're opening up our education centers, taking it out on the road, because we know, and you all know, a child that's left behind is not a child that we want to see. So we, we want to attract those kids that's in the community that's expelled from the traditional school system. And we have $1.5 million in there to deal with that, to where we're going to open those centers throughout the state, five of those uh, in the areas of uh, education and, and community schooling. You'll see also in the re, um, amended budget a reduction of $3 million, and that's a reducing fund in our personnel services that, that reflects the projected expenditures. We support that. Mr. Chair, we also have, and if you don't mind me going back just a second, I can let you know what areas of the state we're planning on putting those particular uh, education um, facilities. Get my paper here. Sign. <clears throat> Those locations are Savannah, Muskogee, Bibb County, mm -hmm. Fulton County, and Bibb County, Richmond, Muskogee, Chicago. Richmond, Fulton, and Chatham. One may ask, why did we choose those areas? When you look at what sent us the most business and what's expelled from the school system, the traditional school settings, those are the areas. And we want to attract those areas first to help cut down on the prison to school or from school to prison pipeline. And that's a, an enhancement that we want to do. We want to be as transparent with those systems that we have on board. Mr. Chairman, do you have any questions? I did, well, one from the chair. I'm sure there will probably be some others on your uh, the secure commitment on the YDCs and the RYDCs. Is that uh, I'm, I'm interested in how you came up with that $3 million savings. Um, what is happening to uh, – um, are, are you are, – I'm, I'm a little concerned with being understaffed. I'm a little concerned about that, and I'd like you to address it, if you would. Well, good. So, so of course, you all know And I support the idea of the okay. community services very much. I mean, I do. Yes, sir. Um, so this time last year, you know, we, we through the governor's office, um, his budget request, and, and, and you all support, we had funds in our budget to help cut down on the revolving door of our turnover at the mm -hmm. JCO level, juvenile correction officer level. As we create those savings by not having turnover, for the first time in, in our past three years, we've had a, a, a baseline to where we retained, and I repeat it, where we retained more individuals than we actually hired, which is a reduction. And so all of those savings were where we hired people and keeping people on the job, that shows that reduction there so that those funds could be shipped. Chairman Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the grant program, is that for community services that local courts or local counties provide for the juvenile courts? So, so there's two different ones. We have a, a, an incentive grant, the 1.5 that we furnish, and then the overall grant for the juvenile justice reform, the juvenile justice the big grant targeted those counties that send us the most commitment. And this internal one is for those individual counties that typically don't send us the most business, but they are, are given the opportunity to help curb their commitments, and that's what the 1.5. So it's all community-based, and it's an intervention-type program to prevent kids from getting into the deeper end of juvenile justice. All right, but, but my understanding is part of juvenile justice reform yes, sir. is that we are the, the nonviolent, the less, least dangerous are being kept in the community and provided services in the community, correct? That's correct. Sir. And that's what the $1.5 million grant is for? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. My next question is, 
are there any counties or circuits that are not applying for or getting these grants? Because I'm concerned that there are places in the state that are not being able to send troubled youth to the YDCs or our YDCs, but are not providing the community services. So basically, we've got business as usual, but no uh, commitment alternatives. Well, and, and that's the, the purpose of those counties, again, that committed us the most business. But my question is, are there counties that are not applying for the grants and therefore are not providing the enhanced community service that, that juvenile justice reform it in looks toward as far as part of the solution? And if there is, and, and, and I don't recall that today, but if there is, it's very, very low numbers of those counties that's not engaged in the process. If, if you come back for the big budget, would you uh, have that information for yes, me? Yes, sir. And okay. I'll be able to get that information by the close of business to you today. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But one follow-up question on that, if I, if I may, that I would like to know is, is about the retention of your juvenile officers and also uh, their pay scale. If you could uh, provide me that later, that would be fine, or now, if you have okay. it. Okay. And, and the question is... Uh, concerning how and what portion of that uh, the funds went to those officers? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Correct. Uh, I have that with me. Uh, so, so uh, an officer, you know, last year we, we, we started our juvenile correction officers out with 24,322. The creation that you all supported through the governor's budget allowed our officers to to get a 5% increase, taking them to 25, 538, after they complete that first six months of training to become those certified um, correction officers. And then within a year, one calendar year of their employment, they would go to $27,472. Uh, that's from 24 when they walk in the door to one year of service after they have completed the training to 27,472. And then the big budget, you would see that, that we, Governor has supported us with the, that to carry on to this upcoming year to help curve and get those officers the baseline salaries. Okay. Thank you. Senator C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was recently in a school district meeting and you spoke in your presentation about the um, kids who are having challenges, mental health and otherwise. Are you seeing any drug relations in some of those? Because they spoke about some of those kids were coming from um, drug addicted parents to whom they were birthed. So can you speak on that a little bit, please? Yes, ma'am, and, and, and I'll first tell you that um, we do see that, um, and, and it's showing up within those youth uh, that, that come in, and, and like I indicated, over 50% of them have some sort of, of substance abuse, and a lot of those are, are drug uh, usage or um, situations of that sort. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Senator. Chairman Willard. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, sir. I was, I was hearing some comments about the uh, grants. Does your department do grants to the local courts for these local programs in any way, or is that all done through CJCC? CJCC. All right, so you're not actually doing your own grants. They're That's correct. fun going that way. Yes. What about the short-term detention center situation? Yes. How's how has that been affected by the uh, justice reform, juvenile justice reform that we've done? And, and, and that's an excellent question because what happens traditionally before juvenile justice reform kicked in, we had a backlog of kids sitting in our RYDCs waiting for treatment in our long-term facilities, which is the YDCs. Now what we're seeing is the the door is somewhat closing slowly for those kids entering in the RYDC 
so that we can move the kids into those beds in the YDC. The YDC population uh, is, is going out into the community. So it's freeing up those beds in the YDC so we can use some stratification and get in the right kid in the right bed for the right treatment. Let me follow up a mic with that to, to clarify. We used to have a lot of children being put in, youth being put into what we call short-term detention. That's the regional yes, sir. centers. Has that modified, changed for the better as far as what the uh, juvenile courts are doing with uh, uh, short-term detention? Yes, sir. And I mean by short-term, we're talking about the law limits them up to 60 days, I believe, isn't it? Yes, sir. And is that still widely used? It's being modified, lessened, greater? What's happening it, there? It's, it's greatly, <coughs> greatly decreased, uh, and that those juvenile court judges are, are, are investing into the juvenile justice reform and not committing or using those short term mm -hmm. for long term. Um, with juvenile justice reform, some 1,700 kids have been diverted from coming into RYDC because of alternatives that the judicial, the judges have for those kids. That's in one year? That's 1,700. One year, Good move. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair neglected to recognize Senator Huffstetler uh, have just joined us. With he is chair of the um, Appropriations for Criminal Subcommittee for Criminal Justice. So welcome, Thank Senator. Uh, Senator Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your great work. My question is really just on you know motivating the team, et cetera. So you've got these what I would consider low salaries, um, and I know we can't just do a carte blanche raise for all of your your personnel on the, that are your officers. But what is their uh, upward mobility in terms of, of, of getting raises or getting to the next level of, of being an officer? Are you seeing upward mobility within your, within your team? We, we are, and, and, and the good thing about um, the way that we have put a focus on retention, secession planning, <coughs> we have, have been able to really attract those individuals, utilizing a, a more rigid uh, process of, of starting those officers out and showing them up front where or do you want to go within our system and creating that, that atmosphere mm -hmm. of career planning when we first sit down with them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that have longevity within the system if an individual coming into our system understand where he or she could be within three to five years. And the upward momentum is, is greatly, greatly enhanced by the quality of officers that's coming in our doors. And, a, and an example of that is, uh, you know, we do a, a lot of hiring of veterans. Uh, we, we, because of what they can bring to the table and to help guide the misguided. And the focus is there, and, and those individuals that's coming in have a, a, a strict guidance of where they want to go with their careers. And, and the avenues is opening up so that those individuals can be promoted. Yes, sir. Just w one follow-up, if I may, Chairman. Um, go ahead. Um, how do we compete with other states in terms of our initial salary offering? Last year when we done the status salary um, survey, Georgia was, was in the southeast region pretty much in line with everybody else. But what happens is you have a lot more police departments, a lot more sheriff's offices in the state of Georgia, uh, and a lot more opportunities in Georgia that, that the law enforcement segment starts officers out. Uh, with a lot because it's a lot more requirement, whereas uh, you have to be 21 and, 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 and uh, possess a firearm and all those. And our guys and girls that, that typically come to us are those 18, 19 year olds. Okay. Um, and they understand working inside versus in the law enforcement segment, um, out inside and they wear the fancy badges and drive fast cars. 
I give my guys a radio and a flashlight. Uh, so, so that's the difference. But, but we we're in the competitive market, and and you you probably will hear this from Commissioner Owens. We try to make sure that our scales are are the same because we don't want guys and girls jumping from one end yeah. to the other one for fifty cent. Uh, so we're <laughs> in line and we support each other in that. I understand. Thank you. Yes, sir. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank both of you for coming this morning. I always look forward to, not necessarily you coming, Commissioner, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. My question is, to, to kind of look at the success, have you, have you got any numbers on the percentage of graduates or people who come out of your program and end up in Commissioner Owens's? You know, I want to know, are we, are we doing any good down on this end, right. you know? Well, and, 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 and Commissioner Orange and myself constantly talk about, um, I'm trying to put him out of business. Um, because if, if we really, really want to focus on tomorrow's behavior, you might want to look at what's going on currently within our system. And juvenile justice reform is going to give us a clear indication because if we can get to them early enough mm -hmm. and prevent them from graduating into Commissioner Orange's shop, then that's when we start gauging it. So we're, we're two years into okay. the reform, and, and I think that um, this year or the end of 16, we should see a, a payoff, um, and, and, and not necessarily in a money but in a diverting of monies to the prison system to where you really, really see a focus on through the accountability courts that, that, that's funded in the adult system to where you really see the benefits of individuals not getting into the deeper end of the judicial system to where the payoff is that life saved and redirected in the community. So, so, but we are monitoring that, and and I'll be able to furnish greater numbers as as it it okay. resolves. I understand. Yes, sir. Thank you, Representative Williams. Uh, Chair will entertain any other questions from the committee. Hearing none, thank you for your testimony. Well, thank you, sir, and we appreciate everything you do, and I look forward to to next year. Thank you. You just bring the coffee next time, okay? Bring the coffee, okay. <laughs> next up, Department of Corrections, Commissioner Owens. That's my hero coming up next. Commissioner, welcome. Thank you. And uh, we will entertain your testimony when you're ready. So. Very good, sir. The, as we talked about yesterday in joint appropriations, the governor has recommended approximately $4.3 in our amended budget. And of that $4.3 million, $3.2 million is dedicated to uh, increasing our RSAT capacity. RSAT simply means residential substance abuse treatment. Uh, on the front of the system, prior to them coming into the prison system, and then enhancing our GED capabilities. As we know, nearly seven to 10 inmates come to us without a high school diploma or GED. Our FY16 recommendation is for 47.2 million, and essentially that covers three areas in our department. Uh, the first is uh, $12 million for a correctional officer pay increase, and we'll talk a little bit about that if the committee um, so chooses to hear that. Uh, the statewide uh, merit increase of $5.3 million and then the bulk of the rest of it, 13.3 million, yeah. is for enhanced vocational education opportunities for our inmates. Commissioner, not to cut you off, could you uh, you you are talking about the 2016 budget? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Could now you I could you direct the members of the committee where you're looking at? Yes, sir. It begins on page what page are we on, Ken? Okay. 
Go ahead. And, and as I said, uh, a total of a $17.3 million pay increase for correctional officers, and that includes the $5.3 million, 1% merit increase. $13.3 million in total for vocation education and treatment opportunities, particularly drug treatment for our population. And then uh, a little over $10 million in retirement premiums. So all in all, that $47.2 million increase for 16, about $45 million of it in those three functional areas for the department. A couple of the highlights as we talked yesterday. Uh, we've seen demonstrable success as well as criminal justice reform, just as our colleagues in juvenile justice have had. We've seen a 14% decline in prison commitments between 2008 and 2013. That is very good for Georgia. Uh, some of the side effects of that particularly impact our communities of color, our minority population. We've seen a 33% decline in the number of African-American females coming to the Georgia prison system. We've seen a 19.5% decline in the number of African males coming to the Georgia prison system. And we've seen a smaller, more moderate decline in the white population coming to the Georgia prison system. Well, I would attribute the vast majority of this to the success of the accountability courts that the governor has funded through the year. But fundamentally now, as a state, focusing on the disease of addiction, on the disease of mental illness, rather than on the symptom of addiction and mental illness, which is crime. So we are now, as a state, truly putting the appropriate people in these hard prison beds. We're putting violent sex offenders in these prison beds. <coughs> Five years ago, if I were to testify on this fact, I would have told you six in 10 inmates in the Georgia prison system are in there for a violent slash sex offense. Today, just five years later, that number hit 70%. So seven in 10 inmates in the Georgia prison system are definitely the ones that need to be there because they're the predators. I don't know if we're on or off now. Are we on now? So we're sure so I think we're doing it right. All right, let me start over. You you were you were on on this end. So. There was a there's a lot of success, and I was asked yesterday a question from one of the members of the joint committee about uh, how Georgia and other states are doing it, and really Georgia and one other state is doing it. Uh, it's Texas. Right. Texas led the way with their criminal justice reform, and when the governor took office. I had the great pleasure of telling him, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to need about $270 million for new prison construction uh, five years ago or four years ago. As is the case now, we're seeing that prison population drop and getting to the right size. So our focus uh, for, for fiscal year 16 in the budget sphere will be enhancing the educational opportunities for our inmate population, enhancing the drug treatment opportunities for those who are not yet in prison, and then enhancing vocational education. We're actually funded to create, uh, at three locations, a diesel mechanic course. As we talked yesterday, you don't want to take our men and women, typically, who come from prison and put it behind the counter of a Holiday Inn. They just don't have those customer service skills. They don't have the education. Uh, they don't have those social skills, so to speak. But if you take a man and put him under the hood of a diesel truck or put him behind the, the, the mask of a MIG welder, they can earn a living wage and stay out of the prison system. That in concert with the Governor's Office of Transition Support and Reentry, which was formed last year, two years ago, uh, by executive order. That's your former colleague, Mr. Jay Neal, who leads up that effort over there. They're working to help us transition men and women out of the prison system and stay out of the prison system. So for the Governor's first term, we really worked on the front end of the system. We worked in accountability course, changing some sentencing laws, uh, adding some additional treatment resources out there. Um, 
we streamlined the sentencing process. It's all electronic now, Mr. Chairman. Standardized electronic, which has been a dream for 20 years, we're there. We had five years ago 5,000 inmates waiting in county jails waiting to come into the Georgia prison system. As of last Monday, we had 150. It's streamlined sentencing process now, so that once we receive that electronic sentencing document, on average, four business days later, they're in the Georgia prison system. Five years ago, we paid our counties $25 million to house our state sentenced inmates at $20 a day or $22 a day. Today, this year, we'll, we'll pay virtually nothing because we're getting them in four years. So the system has really been streamlined. The system is downsizing. Our focus will be on the back end of our prison system this, this coming fiscal year to help educate and provide vocational skills to those men and women turning, returning to our communities to the tune of 400 a week coming back to Georgia communities. And, sir, I'll take specific questions. Okay. Chairman Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Good to see you this morning. And I'll have to say over the years of hearing you give a presentation, it sure is enlightening to hear you today because your whole tone has changed considerably. Yes, sir. And I give a lot of credit not just to uh, not just to your y'all's ability to adapt, but also to this administration. You know, for years a lot of us had said that uh, you know we weren't just locking up people that we were afraid of; we were locking up people we were just mad at. Yes, sir. And thanks to the governor's initiative on criminal justice reform, we're getting back to that spot. I got a specific question I want to ask, and it yes, deals with what you were talking about about the rural areas, as uh, as our present census drops, that those in rural areas that uh, that do like to use quote inmate labor per se. Over the years, and this is I'm, this is a throwback question back to 1980 when I was county commission chairman, we had a. A uh, work camp, a prison camp. Uh, I know that's a connotation that a lot of people don't exactly like to hear, but that's exactly what they were, what we used to call the old county camps. And we still have a, a county camp labor program within the DOC. But back in those days, uh, the state, and I know that's a pretty good piece back, but the state basically let it let the counties languish with those type of assistance, weren't paying them enough in the reimbursement fees and all. One of the things that I have had some ideas about and concerns about, and I bring it up from time to time when I'm not fighting with somebody, and that's been that uh, has the Department of Corrections, have they thought about expanding or offering to expand to these counties uh, the opportunity? Because county camps are usually more lower level security. Uh, they're more of those folks who would like to be at work. And we know that in the facilities, the way we're structured today, We've got low-level inmates, quite frankly, that don't need to be in the harder beds and the harder, more expensive facilities. And that some of these uh, county facilities could be possibly constructed uh, in coordination with the counties to have these facilities for the lower-level uh, lower inmates that aren't a risk. They could actually be out there doing something and contributing back instead of being behind. Has there been any discussions uh, through the department about expanding these work camps or to try to open up a program like that? There has been quite a bit of discussion. And actually the problem, Mr. Chairman, is the opposite problem. With the overall state prison population becoming more violent, we're having far fewer lower security inmates, and we have to share those between the 5,000 county camp beds. And, and for those not familiar, a county camp is a county prison run by the county commission funded by the county commission, they hire the warden, we approve the warden, and then we pay $20 per inmate per day for these low-level, healthy men uh, to work at. We have about 5,000 beds there, as you know, Mr. Chairman. We have another 8,000 beds in our private prison system. So that's 13,000 beds who will only take medium security inmates and below. Well, the medium security inmates are starting to go away. So our challenge is actually going to be how do we put the proper inmates in those county facilities? So we've worked uh, with three counties Hall County, Coweta County, and then I can't remember the one up north, but another one. And what we're actually doing, working with our judges, is we're handpicking inmates from the state prisons, putting them into the county prisons. They're working a work detail, and then we're using the county prisons as work release. And the counties are actually keeping the room and board that the offenders used to pay to the state, plus I'm still reimbursing them $20 per day. So we're actually using them for a different reason. We're using them to work inmates back into their home community, and we're doing that currently in three locations. So the challenge is 
We're going to need higher security facilities. That's why we have about a $30 million bond request for you all this year to harden up some state facilities because <coughs> we're seeing so much gang violence coming into the prison system. We're seeing an, a, an incredible increase in the mentally ill. And the prisoners we are getting today are coming in on mandatory minimums or long sentences, so they're going to be with us for a while. So we're very mindful of those county camps. We think transition using one pod, say, for example, at, at the county camp to bring men back home to Hart County or wherever it may be is probably the best way to go. That brings up another question because you're saying, and I, and I know this is probably not a good thing to put you on the spot, but it's a lot of discussion that, that we've had in the legislative circles about mandatory minimums. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, depending on what the crime, the severity of the crime, a lot of these inmates fall within those mandatories, even though that particular crime may not have been suitable or in the in the eyes. Do you have any feel about the, uh, the policy that possibly we need to look at maybe revisiting some of that, like the uh, like the 10-year minimums and things like that? Yes, Chairman. What you're referring to was the 1994 constitutional amendment, uh, which created the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. And there are seven offenses, very serious offenses: murder, homicide or homicide, rape, armed robbery, kidnapping, aggravated child molestation, aggravated sodomy, and I always leave one out. Uh, but the judge has no discretion in those cases. He or she on the bench, if convicted or they take a plea of guilty, must at a minimum sentence to 10 years to serve with no possibility of parole. Pers on a personal level, I voted for that as a young uh, individual. I, I bought into it. It made sense at the time. Today, if you include life sentenced inmates, we have over 16,000 inmates serving under mandatory minimums. So they're stacking in the system. There are exceptions, the Romeo and Juliet exceptions on the rape cases. We've seen cases like that go in. And I'm personally in favor of giving the judges that discretion back to make the right decision. And I think it will help unstack the Georgia prison system. Good for you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Huckstetter. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, Good morning, sir. Several questions here on the program for the GED do we have a targeted number that we're looking at have, have you set any goals yet I, I know it's new to to know but 2,500 per year okay and then second question the uh, the hep C drug do we have a, a contract already and I know that might be more for the DCH but are we getting a, a certain discounted rate on that we are I, thank you for that question I should have brought that up uh, the largest light item, is, as I was questioning yesterday on our budget, uh, is $200 million for the health care, the mental health care, the physical health care, the dental health care of inmates. Uh, as you're probably aware, there are some new drugs on the market to treat uh, hepatitis C. Uh, we partner with Georgia Regents University. Mm -hmm. They provide our health care services for us. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at all types of private vendors that have come in to try to replicate uh, what we've partnered with, and they have not been able to do so. So our formulary for all of our pharmaceuticals is top notch and we get 340b pricing if you're familiar mm -hmm. uh, on many of our pharmaceuticals which take us well <laughs> below the market however this new hep c drug that's on the market is extraordinarily expensive uh, and my understanding i'm not a medical professional my understanding is it puts hep c in permanent remission mm -hmm. with this new drug and the therapy is a little bit shorter mm -hmm. and we have quite a few inmates for hep c we don't test everybody for hep c but when they become symptomatic we do test at that point and our intent is for the more severe cases perhaps the life-threatening cases uh, to treat them with this new regimen of drugs. Okay, great. And I, you, you sort of answered this earlier on the hardening of facilities, but I know we started in Hayes a couple of years ago uh, with hardening that, and I think you guys did a great job up Thank there. Uh, could you update us a little bit more on where we're at in that process, where yes, we've sir. been to, because I haven't been part of this process for the yes, last sir. year. Yes, sir. Be glad to. Hayes State Prison uh, is a close security prison. And I'm going to mix this in, if I may, with the, the pay raise and the justification for pay raises. Mm -hmm. All prisons are not equal. Uh, we have minimum security transition centers. We have minimum security probation detention centers. Uh, we have medium security, large prisons for, for medium security inmates like the Dooleys of the world. And then we have close security prisons, which are for the bad boys. We mm -hmm. have eight close security prisons off the top of my head, uh, which <coughs> house these violent repeat offenders, long-sentenced inmates, uh, the ones that assault other inmates and staff. And then we have what are called special mission prisons. That's like the prison at Jackson, which is a maximum security prison. So as we've gone through the Harding process, we started on the inside out. I mentioned briefly about the prevalence of gangs. And gangs are rising in the Georgia prison system because they're rising on the streets of our cities. 
if you go inside a cell, and you were there sooner, if you go inside a cell, you've got uh, two bunks, you've got a heater cover covering the heater, you have a light fixture, you have a porcelain commode, and you have a metal mirror, and then you have the bars looking at the back. Well, they're ripping those apart across the state of Georgia, using them for weapons uh, to do the little gang wars. So when we talk about Harden, as the senator said, we strip the cell out. We put heavy gauge steel heater covers. We put light fixtures that they can't penetrate. Uh, we we use heavy gauge steel and, and actually bolted the beds through the walls. So we've hardened that process at all of our close security facilities, okay. all of our uh, special mission facilities, and we're in the process of doing that for our mediums with this bond package this year, moving down to the more medium security. Now our pay package this year on an increase targets those staff that work at the special mission prisons and the close security prisons. If it's me, if I have a choice between working in a transition center where the inmates are gone all day long, I probably shouldn't get paid as much as somebody who's working at a Hayes State Prison or a Smith State Prison or a Valdosta State Prison where we have the violent, dangerous, violent, dangerous predators. So the governor's recommendation for our pay package this year targets those COs who work at the close security prisons and the maximum security prisons. Okay, great. And one last quick question, yes, and um, be as vague as you need to be, but communication between prisoners, are we making progress in that? We're area? making some progress. Um, the cell phone seizures are down, but they're still number in the thousands. I don't need to be as secretive now because the inmates know we got it up and running at three prisons. So we actually have cell phone uh, uh, capture technology at three locations, at three close security prisons across the state of Georgia. You also see that uh, the governor's put in $1.5 million for additional cell phone interdiction in a bomb package with some other techniques. It is a constant, constant battle. Yeah. We've read stories of there was, a, there was inmates taken from uh, actually the Bibb County Jail to go visit their dead grandmother at the funeral home, and there were cell phones in a casket for the inmates to bring back into the jail. So they are very creative on these cell phones. We don't have the upper hand yet, but okay. we're making progress, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hightower. I want to uh, ask you about the RSAT program. Yes, sir. Um, when we met before, I asked yes, you questions about this. Um, I'm a big believer in the RSAT program, but my concern is that I know recently this past year it went from six months to nine. Mm -hmm. I know that may be just for program use and it needs that they need that extra time to get through the proper program the concern though that I've had is I've had a couple of my own clients that have had sentences that would have been two years to serve uh, five years probation two years service use as an example and I've had our side as, as an option um, but what's happened is the backlog for the guys to get in is so long and now that it's a nine-month program even though it would have been beneficial for them, and even though they wanted RSAT, when they're looking at that two-year sentence and they run the numbers, they can go, well, I cannot take RSAT. I can be out in half a year to eight months, or I can wait six months to get an RSAT, and then I have nine more. And so we're missing, in my opinion, we're, we're, we're going to miss a large group of people that need that help because of this wait period and possibly because of the longer time. Now, I'm not against the longer time on the nine months because I understand a lot of that is treatment-based and they need that extra time treatment. But if we're going to increase that treatment time, we really have to focus on the backlog because we're going to lose those folks because, like you know, these inmates talk, and they know almost to the day better than I do, and I'm their attorney, something that what day they're going to get out. Mm -hmm. um, and when they run those numbers, it doesn't make sense for that's, them. That's and it's a, a program that they need. we need them yeah. to utilize. That's a great question. You're right on point with it. And actually, we have more females waiting to get an RSAT than we do males at this point. So here's the beauty we're in, referencing Chairman Powell's point earlier. With standardized sentencing and with the prison population dropping, we can now sit at the Department of Corrections and look at the backlog. <coughs> Men waiting to come into prison. Women waiting to come into prison. Men waiting to come into PDCs. Women. Mm -hmm. So our, our approach to that is going to be, number one, we do need to go to a nine-month program. We used to be nine months. And quite honestly, we had much better outcomes on a nine-month program than we did on a six-month program. So years past, it was cut to six. Well, to be true to the treatment principles, NIDA recommends best practices, not a National Institute of Drug something, whatever A stands for. Uh, but they recommend a nine-month program. So we're going back to the nine-month program. We're kind of a victim of our own success because we built out our set so much. So our plans are we capped, if you recall, sentences to PDCs two years ago to 180 days so what has happened, probation detention center, what has happened, we have a zero backlog waiting to get into probation detention centers, and we have empty beds in our probation detention centers. So our plans are is to take two of those probation detention centers, convert them to RSATs, that will eliminate the backlogs for both male and females. So you're right on point with your question. Good. And we're going to do that soon. Awesome. I think that would be very beneficial. Yes, sir. I agree. Thank you, Representative. In fact, you just answered my question. So Judge Caldwell. 
Commissioner, I know with the decrease in the prison population, there's an increase in probation. How are you doing probation officers and retention and staffing of them? Great question. I didn't go into much detail this morning, but as we've expanded our accountability courts, as you know, the offenders have to go somewhere. So instead of coming in the prison system, we're seeing a pretty steep increase in our probation population. We're sitting at about 160,000 felony offenders. We've run short of money, and you'll see in this budget where the governor's going to transfer some funds or recommend transfer some funds from the private prison program and a little bit of health to help make them whole. Now, we are doing very well on maintaining, keeping our probation officers. We do a very good job as compared to our correctional officers there. We're running probably about 11, 12 percent attrition rate, and most of that attrition is right here in metropolitan Atlanta where it's so hard and there's so many other opportunities than becoming a probation officer. But we focused on equipping them uh, with new vehicles, and there's a package in here again for a request for additional vehicles for them, uh, ballistic vests, weapon systems, computer technology. And the governor is recommending, and I've not seen the bill yet, taking probation at the felony level, juvenile justice, and then pardons and parole field officers and merging them into one operation as a separate agency. And that just makes so much sense to me, uh, being an old parole officer when I started, merging those operations because, as you know, if a family is receiving services from multiple agencies, the parole officer drives in the complex, and as he's pulling out, the probationer drives in the complex, and so on and so forth. So I fully support a merger, and I think we're good on probation uh, if this uh, General Assembly will approve some of the budget switches to help us make us whole in probation. But aren't most of, well, I guess brings up another question, but aren't most parolees now are doing it by, by telephone, aren't they? I'm not sure. Uh, they're not visiting as such as they used to. My understanding is, and I'm not parole, but right. my understanding <laughs> is that the parole officers are spending more time in the field than in the offices, but I'm not 100% sure okay. how that works. I think that's Commissioner, I, I want to pick up on what Chairman Powell said. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm extremely glad to see the progress that we've made. And uh, that being said, we were talking about GEDs mm -hmm. earlier or whatever. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to brag for just a second. It's my understanding that you guys are getting ready to have your first graduation ceremony next week. Is that correct? Is it next week or? For Aaron Dillon, is that what you yeah. referred to? Yeah. Um, we're having a grand opening, a ribbon cutting. That's what it is. Okay. Yes, sir. That's okay. Up. But you already have one person that's qualified under graduation. Absolutely. What the representative is referring to there at Arendelle State Prison uh, up in Habersham County, which is a large female prison, uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Buster Evans, who's sitting somewhere behind me, the former school superintendent for Scythe County Schools, who's now uh, assistant commissioner for education for us. We've entered into a partnership um, with the uh, Mountain Charter. Is that what it's called? Mountain Education Charter. And we're actually running a charter high school program at Lee Arendelle State Prison. Uh, we have somewhere around 35 students in there. We have about 2,800 inmates any given day who are under the age of 22 who are eligible to get a high school diploma. So we have had one, yeti, one young lady uh, complete the requirements to get a high school diploma. She completed it very quickly. I'm told by Dr. Evans we actually have two gifted students in the program at Lee Arendelle State Prison. And in July of this year, we're going to do the same thing at Burris Correctional Training Facility in Monroe County for male inmates. So we're really excited for the first time we can ever find. Now, it may have happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. I don't know. First time we can ever find. We're going to actually graduate inmates with a high school diploma. That's great. And then it's also my understanding as a follow-up that you guys are exploring some options it's about letting them pursue uh, their education even further through online. Absolutely. Would you, would you expand on that just yes, a sir. second? I'd be glad to. Uh, you're probably aware, or maybe you're not, that the Department of Justice uh, declared about two weeks ago that Pell Grants are, again, uh, allowable in juvenile correctional facilities. So juveniles will be able to use the old Pell, get, Pell Grant program that was stopped in 1994 for prisoners. We have about 3,000 inmates, roughly, who are veterans of the United States military. And we're starting to put uh, veterans in dormitories together, and we're going to put the computer equipment uh, there won't be Internet access. They've got technology now that blocks you away from that to where these men and women could use their GI Bill benefits and go ahead on their own and earn their college degrees. And we're working with three specific universities, University of North Georgia, Fort Valley, and then uh, Metropolitan State College here in Atlanta who offer 100% online courses. So if an individual has the benefits to be able to do that or the family has the wherewithal, why not allow them to get that college education while they're in there? But uh, we're not requesting any state funds for that. So I think it's probably a fair statement. Um, to say that 
Education is the key to the whole thing. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Great. So Thank I you, sir. We, I think we all know that intuitively. Thank you, sir. You have, I'm sorry, I have noticed on the health section that you have a utilization of existing funds to implement electronic health records. Uh, do you happen to know the cost of? I do, and it's, it's still fuzzy at this part. We're working with GRU. Obviously, we're not going to get too far down that road until we get authorization to do that. We're estimating that the first two years will be the expensive years because you're taking all the hardware and you're buying the systems or you're getting the training. We think uh, years one and two will be around $4.5 million. And we think that on the out years, once we buy the equipment, buy the software, it's probably run around $1.3, $1.5 million to keep it operational. The benefit mm -hmm. to that is we'll have electronic health records on 55,000 standing inmates, but we get 20,000 new ones a year. So we could do some prescriptive medicine rather than waiting on the, on the problems to occur, to occur and then dealing with them. Great. And you're able to use existing funds for that. Yes, sir. We'll right. try to. Outstanding. We have time for two more questions. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief Commissioner, Hi, sir. Um, this is not tongue-in-cheek. I'm very serious here because as you move toward that high percentage of hardcore prisoners, that's going to increase safety concerns for your COs. And you're looking at even prison rapes and the real tough stuff. You know, trying to soothe the raging lion and lioness. Are we looking at all the conjugal visits? You know, that's no, a sir. lot of pent up. No, sir. I'm certainly glad you gave that a lot of consideration. It was difficult to answer. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. I mean, okay. I'm moving right along. Thank you. <laughs> Chair appreciates that. Actually, it's going the other way. There are about three or four states that still allow it. Mississippi's just changed their policy to make it no longer allowed. So I think New York does, I think California does, and Mississippi used to, I think. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Or uh, Representative Williams. Chairman Powell. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I would have him on my first meeting as chairman. That's good. Huh? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you're losing control. I am. I am. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, following up on Alan Powell's questions regarding the mandatory minimum. Yes, sir. We had a chance to talk in Forsyth a couple of months ago when the committee was down there and talked about the possibility of using the risk assessment tool to retroactively come back and look at some of these people uh, serving mandatory minimums to see where they would fall in the spectrum if we did not have mandatory minimums. Have, have you had a chance to look at that? I asked that it had been done. I've not followed up, however, but I can do that quickly. Okay. I'd appreciate that because that would, I think that would be helpful to know whether we were um, making a useful effort if we wanted to change that law or if they would have been long-term prisoners regardless yes, of what we did. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? We have a couple of minutes. Hearing none, thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, sir. Look forward to working with you. Last up is the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. Welcome, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Michael Nell. I'm Executive Director for the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, and this is uh, Lisa Reed, our Budget Director. Appreciate your time here this morning. Uh, I'll certainly be brief and respectful of your time. I'll cover first the uh, amended uh, 15. There are basically two minor increases of approximately $150,000. I'm referring to page 142 last section there under parole supervision. Uh, the two changes provide for the increase of intensive supervision uh, in association with a Georgia pre, uh, 
Georgia Prison Reentry Initiative. Uh, so that is part of the increase and also increase uh, funds for an additional housing coordinator position. Uh, when you look over to FY16, uh, those are annualized along with all the other traditional increases when you talk about uh, retirement and, and insurance, things of that nature. The only additional uh, add in FY16, uh, working off page 288, is going to be increased funds to calibrate and recalibrate the existing offender risk supervision instrument. Uh, you've heard uh, Commissioner Niles and Commissioner Owens talk about a hardening of the prison population. Our risk assessment instrument was last validated in 2008. Uh, typically, you want to have those validated about every five years. Certainly, the offender population in 2008 is not the same offender population as it is today. So uh, that additional uh, add of 75,000 is to validate that and, and recalibrate it, if you will. Uh, I've got to say, after being in this business for uh, 26 years, uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, the past three years have been incredible for criminal justice reform. There's a great deal of momentum and a great deal of synergy, uh, and I'm excited. Uh, I would like to take just a few moments to uh, touch on some highlights of successes that we've had as an agency uh, and answer some specific questions that you may have. Uh, you've received a handout. Uh, I'm sure you don't have much to read uh, ever, so I figured I'd indulge you there. So uh, I did want to point out on page four of that handout, uh, under our clemency operation, uh, our guideline compliance rate for the board is 90%. That's the highest it's ever been. Uh, that is uh, exceeding what is accepted in the industry, if you will. Four years ago, guideline compliance was at 72%, uh, and then it rose to 74 and then 76, and now we are at 90%. Uh, a lot of that is because of the hard work being done, uh, and, and uh, we'll continue to look at that and continue to strive for 90%. Industry standards say 70% is acceptable, allowing for 15% deviation up, 15% deviation <laughs> down. Uh, so I'm very pleased uh, to report on that. Also, we've embarked upon our entire clemency process is now electronic as is our field supervision system. Uh, no more paper. Uh, so everything we do is, is online and uh, through computer. Under the parole supervision, very pleased to report that uh, Georgia continues to lead the nation, according to Bureau of Justice Statistics, in successful parole completions. They lead it at 72%. That is 10% better uh, than the national average on successful parole completion. Uh, Representative Caldwell, uh, good to see you, sir. I would like to take an opportunity to address your question at this time, if I may. Uh, we actually have seen a 75% increase in face-to-face -face contacts with parolees. The reason that is the case, because two years ago we embarked on closing all of our field parole offices. We are now in a virtual environment because of our electronic capabilities. No longer does the parolee come to the office and report to us, we go to them. That's where community serve, uh, supervision is done. Uh, Pew Charitable Trust Foundation states that, and as a result of moving to that system, uh, we were able to increase our contacts last year by 75% without any additional staff, and quite candidly, uh, field supervision needs to take place in the field, uh, not in the office, 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Uh, I'll touch on one other initiative that has helped us to do that as, as well. When we talk about operation support, I want to applaud our victim services unit. They embarked upon a national model of a victim offender dialogue, uh, which has been successful. Uh, we're in our second year of that now. Uh, in this past year, uh, the parole board, five members of the parole board, met face to face with 559 victims uh, throughout the state, representing uh, approximately 2,000 uh, that were involved in that process of that 559 victims. So, uh, victims obviously continue uh, to have a voice in the process. So, I'm just proud, proud to uh, report that. Uh, finally, on, on page seven, I don't want to ever miss the opportunity. Uh, 
to commend the good work of our staff and our men and women in the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. Uh, this past year, we received the Excalibur Award from the Technology Association of Georgia for our Georgia-based AnyTracks private-public partnership. That's a voice recognition system. Uh, again, this may address some of the, the misnomer of, of folks calling in. Uh, when you have limited resources, you target your high-risk, high-needs. If you target your low-risk, low-needs, uh, you're going to actually do more harm than good. What we are able to do is partner with this company. It costs the state absolutely nothing. There's been about 14,000 offenders that have passed through this voice recognition system with less than a 2% failure rate. What that shows is the right offenders are in the right program, and we're not devoting critical resources to them. We're able to shift our resources to the high-risk, high-need offenders, so I'm very proud of that. Just recently awarded by the Association of uh, Probation Parole, American Probation Parole Association Award for Excellence in Community Crime Prevention for our successful implementation for our Max Out Reentry Program. That was a concept initiated a year ago where we actually put a parole officer in each one of the Georgia Department of Corrections transition centers. They take responsibility for those offenders that are maxing out. Keep in mind, without these programs, these are the very offenders that in Commissioner Owen's prison system sometimes would be under guard of two correctional officers up until the day they're released, given a pat on the back, $25 a bus ticket, and say, good luck. Uh, that's not good public policy. Uh, this takes ownership of those offenders, works with them for 12 months. Uh, many of these cases are, are cases that previously the board voted to max out and not grant parole, and they have an opportunity to prove themselves with the assistance of these probation officers and parole officers throughout the community that can help them transition, whether they're going to be going directly to parole or directly to probation. Uh, so it's been very successful. Finally, when we talk about technology and working in a virtual environment, you've heard schools that have bring your own technology. That, is, in essence, is where we are uh, with the parole population. Our parole officers can do their job from just about anywhere. A uh, classic example on a conference that we were headed to uh, several months ago, uh, the chair of the parole board, instead of having downtime on the airplane, uh, was able to vote cases at 30,000 feet because of our technology. So the work continues. Uh, we're more efficient by it, we're more effective by it. Uh, recently, Google recognized us as a government transformer. And we're very proud of that uh, through the utilization of what they refer to as our cutting edge uh, technology. So that's where we've been. That's where we're at. A little bit moving forward, uh, we continue to partner in the Georgia Prison Reentry Initiative. Has great success. You've heard the awarding of four grants uh, to the Governor's Office of Transition Support and Reentry for about $7 million. Uh, that is going to continue to make a huge change. One other thing that I'd like to bring your attention that we'll be focusing on is uh, programming efforts for transitional age youth. Uh, those offenders under parole supervision are age 18 to 25 clearly offend uh, far more than anyone over the age of 25. So you can't apply the same supervision strategies to somebody that's over 26 as you can an 18 to 25 year old. And when we back, went back and looked at that number specifically, those that are 18 to 25 under parole supervision violate their parole two times as much. Uh, so we've got to have different supervision strategies. That's where the national model is taking us, and we hope to lead in that effort. Also, the impact of trauma. Uh, just recently, the correctional system as a whole has been identifying trauma and the impact of trauma, and uh, not just identifying it, but effectively treating it and addressing it uh, this is childhood trauma uh, as well as adult trauma, but that is new in the field and we'll continue to do that. Uh, finally, a couple of exciting uh, things. We've enhanced our mobile capability in, in concert with the Georgia State Patrol. Colonel McDonough, we're certainly appreciative of him and his staff in partnering with us in the field with the excellent working relationship, and we're about to pilot the utilization of body cameras. Uh, this will be a small pilot. Uh, it's interesting, the body cameras are not uh, as the policing body cameras are designed to do. Uh, what we're actually utilizing these for is to help us train and manage our parole officers where we can see from any location 
their interaction. It's one thing for a chief to ride with a parole officer and see it. It's another thing to see it when nobody is riding along to see how effective they are in their interaction with the offender. So uh, that's where we're at. I continue to be very appreciative of your support in our efforts as we continue to lead the nation in parole mm -hmm. and community supervision. And I'll entertain any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for being here. A couple of questions, particularly with the relationship between your, the prison wardens and, and, and our prison reentry yes. program. The $7 million for the pilot, I think, in five areas. That's correct. I, I would certainly hope that as we move into this, $7 million, of course, is a drop in the bucket. I hope we don't end up with what we ended up with with our public defenders program on the front end. We funded it at one level and never bothered to take it to the funding that it was intended. So now we're, we're rapidly headed back to where we were in the old days because you can't hire your folk for what we're paying. But if we're going to aggressively pursue that and deal with this in relation to making sure that when you let them out that they stay out. Additionally, it's concerns, I have concerns, I get calls all the time. Expungement is a word that's never gotten to be a reality. We're talking about now leaving out some facts on applications where people can get work. Goodness, we're still at the point where DUI can't get expunged. Without, it, it, is, it is cumbersome. And little things like this are going to defeat, if they're not corrected, the goal of trying to close that revolving door. You got any thoughts on expungement and, and, and making sure that when this program goes full bloom with your uh, with the prison reentry connection, that expands out and not forget. You know, I don't want to be remembered r as a rural legislator for all of our prison camps and little of our prison reform. So, you know, I hope that, you know, it seems like we, we forget about small to mid-level cities when we do. I know the numbers, but, you know, we're just as concerned about prisoners in my county as they are in Fulton or any place else. You know, give us some feedback. A absolutely, as, as well as we, we should be. Let me address the first part. Uh, with the Governor's Office of Transition Support and Reentry under uh, Director Neal and, and assigned to Commissioner Owens, Department of Corrections, uh, one strong piece of all of that is sustainability. It's one thing to get something off the ground. It's another thing to sustain it and continue the success. Uh, so this grant actually has components built in that you must show sustainability and a plan to sustain your efforts. So with that, I have great comfort. As to the expungement, uh, that is a, a difficult issue in and of itself. I know that with a pro uh, board, a lot of people mistake a pardon uh, mm -hmm. for an expungement. Right. Uh, a, a pardon won't get you a whole lot. It truly won't. Uh, but I will say, and I applaud the Criminal Justice Reform Council for their efforts, uh, they are looking to remove or set to the side any impediment to someone getting gainful employment. And we certainly know a criminal record does that. Uh, so I will say they continue to be focused on that. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy sell. It's, it's uh, very much has a lot of divide on whether or not it should go through. But those are just my thoughts on it. I think as a system we've got to continue to do everything we can to remove those impediments uh, that bar someone from being a successful uh, taxpaying contributing citizen. <coughs> Thank you, Representative. Representative Ballinger. Yes, thank you. Um, I noticed that you, um, I was a victim advocate for a long time, and sure. I noticed that, um, you know, a lot of victims don't necessarily get notification um, whenever somebody is going to be paroled. Um, what are the controls? I noticed that you said you're going to be um, providing more input from victims and prosecutors. What what are the controls and what are those processes? We, we are. Let me let me back into that, if I may. First of all, when you talk about the pardon process, the uh, pro board just recently adopted a rule, in fact, uh, that victims would be notified 
uh, and have input prior to a pardon being granted. So that's one new step. The other step is when they register, when victims register at the front end, uh, they then, that's where the notification process starts. Uh, many times they, they will not register at the front end. Uh, and we have to go looking for victims to see if they want to be registered. Uh, but traditionally, uh, they are given notification by law uh, of the parole proceeding, and they are given an opportunity to protest uh, that release. That, that's, that's one area. The other area is when I reference Victim Visitors Day uh, going around to four to six different areas throughout the state, meeting face to face with victims. That's another way to give them the opportunity to register if they did not register. And we do that as a, a coordinated effort with the uh, victim uh, witness assistant programs uh, through uh, respective district attorney's office, if that answers your question. Thank you, Representative. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will preface this question by saying it may be misdirected, but when we, we started talking about victim services, it triggered this question in my mind. We have focused a lot on, rightfully so, and I'm very glad that we have focused on treating the disease and not the symptom of the disease with our prison population. We are trying to treat with um, treating mental health issues, addiction issues, and things like that. Is your office, or are, are there any other offices in Georgia that are addressing um, the needs of victims? Um, and that would be whether they are themselves suffering from mental um, injuries because of a result of a rape or other uh, uh, violent crime, or perhaps they have, because of the trauma from the situation, withdrawn from work or school, and they themselves need help re-entering life as a as a person before uh, an, an incident like this. So my question is, are, is your Office of Victim Services addressing those kind of needs? And if not, is there someone else? And if not, is your office equipped to do that? And what sort of resources would you need from us? Yes, we, we are, in very good question, we are absolutely addressing it. Victim Services goes beyond just notifying victims of parole consideration or notifying them when someone is released. Uh, we have an entire complement of staff Although we do not provide those services directly in communication with these victims, whether it's in person, whether it's via telephone, uh, we will work with them to address those needs and provide the appropriate referrals to address those needs, uh, depending on where they are living and what resources are available. Uh, we, in essence, are already dialed in, same as our parole officers in providing uh, treatment referrals to offenders. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same mechanism. It's just done through our victim services unit. And one follow-up, if I could, Mr. Chairman, sure. are, 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 the, sir, are the resources from this body adequate? I believe they are. I believe, again, if, if, you were, if there was an expectation for us to deliver it directly, I, it would absolutely be a no. Uh, but through community resources, mm -hmm. our, our CSBs, private partnerships, yes, there are adequate resources out there uh, in addressing the victim services needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Chairman Huffsettler. Follow up on Representative Ballinger's question. You know, I know from a victim standpoint, they've said we're not part of this hearing. We don't know how the vote was. There's no transcript. Is Are all those still going to be the same? I mean, are, are they going to be notified, but will they be able to to know what evidence is presented and, and even the reasoning of why these decisions are made? They will be able to uh, certainly have input in a, in a protest as to the Reasoning for the granting of the pardon, uh, that right now was not adopted by the rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. But one, one clarification on, on whether it's a, it's a paroling uh, decision or, or a pardon decision, there are, in fact, things that have to be in place for a pardon to be considered, just a general pardon. You have to be at least five years beyond the completion of your sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have been crime-free uh, during that time, the revamping of the pardon process requires uh, three reference letters uh, from an outside source, someone close to the offender. There has to be an explanation as to why they are even seeking a pardon. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are just some of the things that have been, been put in place. So there's, there's a bit of a due diligence on their part to follow the process. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions from any other members of the committee? Hearing none, I...
thank you for your yes, time. Sir. Look forward to working with you. I want to thank everyone for sticking with the with the time schedule. Also, as a chair, I want to recognize uh, Chairman the the members of at least the House uh, committee. I look forward to working with you. I also want to thank. Uh, uh, Senator Huffstetter, as well as Senator John Albers, for their work and, and uh, co-chairing this. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I want to say, and I think he may have stepped out, uh, Chairman Jay Powell is moving on to Ways and Means. He's done a great job and great service for this committee over the last four years, and he's going to be very big uh, shoes to fill. And I think he may have stepped out, but I want to thank him publicly. I think he's done a good job. If the members of the House SAC could kind of huddle up with me, some housekeeping things outside, we're concluded. Thank you. Adjourned, I mean.